So look, thanks very much for joining us. Um, tonight's webinar is uh, on the concept of energy deficit or energy deficiency in red S. Um, as with some of the other webinars, what we're really trying to do is talk about some very simple practical strategies that we can look to implement into your practice uh, at tomorrow. So it's my absolute pleasure to be uh, joined tonight by Dane Baker and uh, by Dr. Sarah Beeble. Um, we'll maybe start by introducing you, Dane. Um, you're a, a performance dietitian or sports dietitian um, who currently works with high performance sport, um, New Zealand Sevens Rugby, the Blues, and work at Otago University. Um, so uh, thanks very much for joining us, Dane. Awesome to be here. Yeah, no, looking forward to it. And uh, our other panelists tonight is Dr. Sarah Beeble. Sarah. Um, is a sport and exercise physician who's based in Queenstown. Although I should say with both of these guys, with the advent of the, uh, the telehealth consultation, they're pretty much everywhere these days. So um, based in Queenstown, currently working uh, with snow sports, but has a long history of working with bike. Um, and is going to be part of the New Zealand team should they ever get to the Tokyo Olympics. Um, an interesting fact about Sarah is that she's a, an ex-athlete herself, having uh, participated in triathlon and Ironman triathlons. Um, and like Dane, both, uh, both Dane and Sarah have an interest in, in athlete well-being, uh, Red S, obviously, um, and in athlete mental health. So, look, thanks very much for joining us, Sarah. Thanks, Mark. Thank so, I, I thought I'd start, Dane, just... Um, a lot of people probably don't know what a performance dietitian is and what the difference between a dietitian and a nutritionist is. So could you maybe uh, give us the rundown? Well, to be fair, I've just made up the term performance dietitian, but um, <laughs> ultimately, yeah, so we're a dietitian. So I'm a New Zealand registered dietitian, which means I'm, I guess, clinically trained, um, have that clinical background and our sort of education is governed by New Zealand dietitians, uh, the board. So we have a controlled education I guess which goes over five years so I um, like to think that yeah definitely sort of well educated in the area of nutrition and dietetics. Nice one all right so look I, the, the, the talk tonight is about red s so I suspect most of uh, the people out there have heard of that term and uh, probably have read something about it but um, maybe Sarah do you think you could talk about what energy deficit or energy availability is um, maybe either of you? Yeah, I'll, I'll take that one, and I, I think we'll go back and forth a little bit. So Jane and I work pretty closely on this on this issue, but I think just to do some uh, definitions for everybody. So red is standing for relative energy deficiency in sport. So it's a syndrome that encompasses kind of the the causation being low energy availability. So I'm just going to show you a slide which probably shows us quite well um, where this. Just let me know if we, we're, we're, we're in business here. We're in business. So just we're um, what we're going to do tonight is, is have a combination of some slides um, and a bit of a chat. So um, maybe, Sarah, if you want to kick it off with some slides. So I mean, we can all see this one here. Cool. <laughs> we got that one? Yeah, all good. Yeah. So when we talk about low energy availability, Basically, what we're trying to work out is um, where the daily energy from food and drink uh, is taken off the daily cost of exercise. Is it enough to support your physiology, your metabolism, your general body functions? And what we see in relative energy deficiency or relative energy deficiency in sport or functional hypothalamic amenorrhea, which is really hard to say, so I prefer red S. Um, it's, it's when the the cost of the exercise is exceeding the uh, energy that's been taken in. And sometimes this is purposeful. So sometimes there's disordered eating behaviors that go with it. And sometimes it's completely unconscious and just people are doing too much, too busy to eat enough. And then the body can start to shut down. And you might see our little battery save mode thing there in the bottom right. So I always liken this to a the iPhone when you're not getting enough and you're not getting enough charge into your body and the body starts to shut down. So the essential energy goes to things like your brain and your heart and less into the other, other functions that might be important, less important than your, your heart. 
and your um, and your lungs and things. And so often that's bone, often it's um, the immune system, and so a whole range of uh, body systems can be affected. So there's really so kind of encomp encompasses low energy availability, which we will cover a little bit later. Cool. So, I mean, you've got some slides there, Sarah. Do you want to do you want to kick on yeah. and uh, and run through those? So, I think the plan here is for you to kind of go through a bit of a practical approach as to how you might assess this type of patient or how you might identify them. Yeah. Yeah. So this is just a slide showing what we kind of talk about before, and I always find people start to kind of understand when we talk about referring to technology. And so, obviously, we want a, a full battery or a, a car that's on all cylinders um, with the yeah, food being a really, really important part of this. So when we look at the negative health outcomes, so there's both health consequences and performance consequences of low energy availability. They used to think really it just involved menstrual function and um, bone health. So traditionally the female athlete triad was uh, what what is kind of expanded now to be more known as red s and that was your traditional kind of anorexic endurance runner who wasn't getting periods and was recurrent stress fractures and osteoporotic and now what we're seeing is there's more of a spectrum and a whole range of body systems that are involved so when we look at I just as an example I mean nearly every patient that I see with red s in my clinic tells me they've been diagnosed with irritable bowel syndrome. And that's one of the gastrointestinal effects um, that we often see with low energy availability relating to absorption and um, almost being in a fasted or famine state a lot of the time. So yeah, there's a whole range of things and people often say they get recurrent illness or uh, they've had recurrent stress fractures, they're iron deficient, they may not be growing as, as quickly as they would like, particularly in the younger age groups. And then one of the really interesting things that I see um, is, and I want to kind of dispel that myth, is you don't have to be skinny or of low BMI to have this problem. So in fact, I think nearly most of my patients uh, actually have probably normal BMI or body mass index, and that's relating to some down regulation of the metabolism that can occur when you're not charging your battery or fueling your car engine well. And then I often find I get more of an uptake into interest when I talk to an, a secondary school athlete about the performance uh, consequences of low energy availability rather than talking too much about health outcomes. Um, they don't really seem too interested in the bone density uh, problem at that age uh, or fertility consequences. But when you start telling them that they may not uh, train as well, they may be less coordinated, their concentration's poor, they are getting, are getting weaker and not recovering well, then you start to get a little bit more buy-in into why this is an important issue. I think that's a, a really important point, isn't it, Sarah, that adolescents are just not programmed to be able to think about the future. No. So making it about the here and now and something that's important to them is probably a pretty important take-home. Yeah, it's really interesting because you often sit with mum who very much cares about is my child they're not getting periods at 17 are they ever going to be able to have children the 17 year old um you know gym goer or elite athlete they they don't really care about that at that age but they're far more interested in what do you mean i won't make the you know representative team or i may not make the commonwealth games team or or whatever and i think that's it's quite interesting um the messaging that you need to target depending who's in the room and that kind of leads me to, to say what uh, there's been quite a bit of uh, research into elite athletes suffering from red S or LEA. And actually you're more likely to have this problem uh, in, the, in the recreational um, realm and secondary school athletes in the recreational sporting realm are actually very, very prone to this as well. That probably reflects a lot of the, the time that you can have for recovery and more time for food preparation and a lot of the support that's wrapped around you as an elite athlete. But actually, that most commonly I'm seeing the secondary school athlete, male or female, actually, um, with this problem. So um, just a quick reminder, everybody, that there is a Q&A section. So um, there's been some very positive feedback come through about my beard, which, um, which I'm, I, I probably can't share with the group. It makes me want to blush a little bit. Um, 
So just remember, if you do want to post something for Dane or Sarah, make sure that you, you post it in the Q&A section and I'll, uh, I'll get back to you. So one of the big risks that we, we do need to talk about, and I think in sports medicine or in your physio practice, is that of stress fractures. So, you know, anybody that um, of, you know, impact sport that can't hop in my clinic room, I do usually suspect uh, a stress fracture if it's gradual onset. And particularly if you ask the question of, are you getting periods in a 17 year old or a 15 year old uh, athlete? Because by 15, that's the age when we're expecting to see regular menstrual cycles. So someone that can't hop has um, lack of periods or you're just getting a feeling by talking to them that they're not eating well and they're maybe overtraining and getting just not quite well, then bone density becomes a really important thing that we need to look at. So the take home point here is in our teenage years is where we lay down our best bone. And so from the age of say 19 or 20, we don't tend to build more bone. We hold on to it until menopause, but this is our chance to build it. And if we are suppressing our hormone access by not having enough fuel or the batteries turned off, then we don't build good bone. And that's important for the here and now, as you, athletes don't like being injured, but it's also important for the long-term consequences of osteoporosis, for example. So that's a really important point. Um, and the other part of that is we don't always see disordered eating, but it's very common. And actually, I think I'd say two out of every three that I see do have disordered eating practices. And this is a big spectrum from full-blown bulimia or um, deliberate severe energy restriction to probably the most common thing, which is most athletes, if there's athletes on this call or coaches may see this constant calculation of energy in and energy out. And it's an exhausting way of living. And it's very, very common in the, in the recreational group, but also in the elite athletes. And so often people who are more maybe training for cosmetic purposes, which is again common, um, they're putting out a lot of effort, but they're restricting to say 1500 calories. Now that's actually disordered eating, um, not probably wouldn't fit anorexia or the criteria that they've traditionally looked at, but again, disordered eating. So sometimes we're looking at just doing too much and sometimes doing too much and not eating enough. So you may have heard, I'll just skip through the rest of these in that day and talk, um, that the female athlete tried, like I mentioned before on the left, and now it's, we just see it as more of a spectrum. So obviously we're aiming for optimal growth, optimal bone health, optimal health psychologically, um, and optimal energy availability. And so we can see anyone on the spectrum. One of the things I find quite fascinating is the type of people that I see. So I'll sometimes see a 95 kilo weightlifter, for example, who is very, very, you know, top at their sport and are eating 1500 calories a day, but expending three and a half thousand. And the amount of people that probably miss the diagnosis because by they're not small BMI, they'd be almost in their over or the higher BMI category, but are severely under fueling. Um, and may lose their period. So just keeping in mind that this is a really different type of a group of people that we can see. And I'll come back to that a bit later, Dane, if you want to take over your part. Okay. So just a question while we're switching over um, is around, is there a sort of individual percentage of body fat that determines when someone might lose their periods? Is there a, a magic number or is it quite individual? No, it's uh, it's very individual. So there's no there's no set cutoff. One of the strongest cutoffs in the literature is, is probably BMI as a sort of clinical tool. So we expect under 18 as a as a BMI as a as a strong indicator. But as I'll sort of explain, the metabolism can be um, can be quite tricky, and everything can slow down. So body fat or body weight isn't necessarily a good indicator. All right, I'll let you crack on. Okay. All right. So I'm just going to quickly touch base on uh, energy availability and sort of maybe uh, walk the participants through what this is, and then we'll bring it to life with a bit of food. So um, just to summarize what Sarah talked about, what energy availability is, it's this concept about when we think about all the calories we have from food and drink, we minus the cost of our daily exercise, then our body needs a certain amount of energy left over. And that energy is the key energy 
basically to think about keeping the lights on in the body. So this energy fuels bone health, um, protein synthesis. So for our coaches out there, athletes, that's sort of potentially our training adaptation, our response to exercise, our rebuilding of, of, of lean tissue, um, reproductive health, immunity, hormonal profile and growth. So the body is really good at when there's not sufficient energy left, it can basically shift energy away from these processes. And that's where uh, menstrual cycle becomes a really key indicator for females. Well, while males, we don't really have this warning sign. So when that energy becomes deficient for a longer period of time, or it's, it's significantly insufficient, those systems can turn off or they can become um, down-regulated. And that's when we sort of use that term of basically we're running on that flat battery. So our, our phone is now basically trying to uh, conserve as much energy as possible. So what does this look like and, and how do we calculate it? And there's a lot of sort of these, these calculations, there's a lot more to them, but what I've tried to do is, is to summarize this and keep it nice and simple. So here we have a soccer player. And the reason we use, uh, I should say football, is that this is probably um, a sport where people traditionally don't think low energy availability exists, but we see it more and more frequently. And the reason being just the training volume and anytime we're doing high intensity uh, running consistently, we're gonna be burning a lot of calories. So this is an example of what low energy availability looks like. So here we've got a 57 kg football player. She's 15 years of age. So if she's consuming 1,850 calories, okay, she's expending 885. So let's say that's a two hour training. So essentially she's got a thousand calories left to her body for all those functions. And when we do these calculations, uh, we, we figure it out by how many calories are left per kilo of fat-free mass. So we can do all those calculations in the clinic, but essentially this is what low energy availability looks like. And from sort of 20 to 30 years of research and well-controlled sort of lab studies that we will start to see um, physiological sort of impairment at this energy availability. So what we're trying to do is to get up to this orange or this green mark. So the orange here, we've got now an energy availability of 30. So now this athlete still doing the same amount of exercise. She's now consuming 2,400 calories. So there's about, let's say there's about 1,400 calories left. So that's sort of what we call moderate energy availability. And down here in the green, this is, this is high energy availability or where we think is sort of thinking around this is sort of energy balance. And so now this athlete's consuming 3,000 calories. And so she's got about 2,200 calories left over to her body. But what we know happens in, in real life and in the field is most athletes can probably sit between this orange and the green. And there's a lot of genetic variation, individual tolerance to when someone might get um, affected by low energy availability. And there's also emerging evidence where it's not just this threshold of 30, where it, it can be the deficit. So a sudden drop of say 800 calories can be just as significant as going under that threshold of 30. So for recovery, when we're dealing with athletes um, and individuals, we're trying to start this energy availability of 45 and, and we might go upwards of this for recovery or potentially the adolescent athlete. So let's just go through what that looks like in a day. So what I've tried to do here is outline what the energy requirements might look like. So here we've got that 15 year old athlete and this is her recovery day. So day at home, off feet, her baseline requirements are about 2,200 calories. Now she goes for that 40 minute run, she's gonna expend about close to 500 calories. So you can see the energy requirement now go up to sort of 2,600 calories. And then what happens, which we see more and more of, especially in the adolescent athlete, is this high training volume. So now she's training in the morning, a skill session, it's light, but she's running for an hour. So she's burning about 300 calories, doing a gym session at lunchtime and that big team training in the afternoon. So you can see now we've got another sort of almost 1400 calories that we need to account for in, the, in our nutrition. And ultimately this is, this is just coming down to fueling. Okay, so the problem that we have is that if we eat at the bottom and we do this, that can easily slip us into low energy availability. And this is when we often see this happen um, with athletes just with lack of awareness around their fueling requirements. And it's not easy to fuel like this. So that's why most athletes we will see when they train hard will be on the spectrum of low energy availability or impaired energy availability. Okay, and then we, when we throw in sort of disordered eating or restricted eating, then we can get further um, low energy availability. So 
I'm just going to show you now what that might look like with food. So let's go to this 2,200 calorie day. So this is our recovery day. And you can see if we have three regular meals, and I'm just putting examples up here. This, this isn't the best food to eat by any means. This is just good, um, well-balanced nutrition. So we might have our three meals and our two snacks. So we know when we're, we're exercising at that level, unless we've got significant um, disordered eating, we're, we're probably unlikely to get into low energy availability. So now when we do this 40 minute conditioning session, the um, simple adjustments we might make is we can add a recovery smoothie uh, with before dinner and maybe we have something before bed. And now what we're trying to do here is we're getting into this higher calorie requirement day. So this is the big day. So this is the requirement here is around 3,500 calories. And you can see this is gonna take a bit of planning. And this is where a lot of athletes um, can go wrong. So now we wanna be eating before training. We still wanna have that breakfast after that morning training, which can be a challenge at school. Maybe we add a little bit to that. So we maybe add a, a flavored milk option. And now what we're doing is we're having a bigger afternoon snack before training to prepare for this big two hour team session. And because we're training for two hours, we're gonna to need to add a little bit of fuel for this session and then look to maybe add a liquid recovery option. And so you can see that sports drinks are definitely not needed for all athletes, but we do have a certain population that require some of these liquid energy drinks to basically be able to fuel and to optimize performance in those trainings. So I just want to quickly- That's quite a bit of food. So what do you tell an athlete to, how do you tell them to cope with this? Yep, so the, the key thing is, as we'll sort of touch on at the end, is just the need for logistics and planning. So that's when some of the time it makes it a lot easier if an athlete can get home, that afternoon snack becomes a bit easier. But definitely the planning around um, snacking at lunch and at morning tea. So quite a lot of the time we're working with athletes with bigger lunches, um, morning tea, and then trying to find a way that they can get that refuel in after the morning session. So whether that's a snack or it's a breakfast that they can easily take with them to eat in the car or in school. And I guess the really important thing, especially when we've got recovering athletes, is avoiding faster training. So that basically prolongs the, the cortisol response, which then suppresses estrogen. And it also just means we have less windows to, to consume energy. So the importance of this really comes down to these good habits of pre and post nutrition. And if we do that consistently, then we, we tend to eat more. So that comes down to a lot of this is, is sort of simple, good sports nutrition. But I think we've, we've lost a lot of context around that with so much sort of misinformation out there with, with sort of fad diets and um, extreme eating practices. So, so Dane, this is quite a good question that's come in. Um, you know, this kind of illustrates how difficult it, it might be to get the fueling right. But the question is around, is there a simple way for, for teenagers, for anyone to know how many calories they are consuming in a day and, and how many calories they should be consuming in a day? Yeah, yeah. There's a little bit of a trick to it because the one thing, if you've got more muscle mass or you're a taller athlete or a bit bigger, then you've got more muscle mass to support. So that, that can increase our basal requirements. And it also means you'll burn more energy when you train. But a good way to think about it could be anywhere between 1800 to 2200 calories as as a baseline and then we're simply adding on energy that we expend and this is where there's a lot of error in assessing energy expenditure and intake but that would give you a good understanding so maybe if it's if you're training once a day and it's moderate those requirements might look like 2800 calories up to sort of those two big training sessions a day that's when we we need to be at least hitting over sort of those 3000 and into the three and a half thousand and then if we're dealing with a professional rugby player and we've got 130 kilos, then that starts looking like five or 6,000 calories. So it really is, is, is dependent a little bit on muscle mass. Yeah, and look, I think one of the things that's really helped me with this is using some of your slides to show people what a good plan might look like. And it's probably a good point to mention that some of your slides in, in this video will be on our Facebook page tomorrow. So if other people want to want to use them, that might be an option too. Cool. Do you want me to keep going or do you want to um, break? Well, I, I don't know. I think you're on a bit of a roll. So yeah. I've, I've got a couple more minutes. So I wanted to just include this because obviously protein is probably the hot hot topic at the moment. And we do spend a lot of time and there's, there's probably a drive now for, for a lot of individuals to use plant-based diets for 
can be ethical, environmental, or some people perceive health reasons. But I guess one of the key things is that protein provides an important energy source. So I just want to explain that how simply cutting out a food group can have some serious implications on your energy intake. So this is an example of, let's say this is from the USOC, and this, this is what most people might be familiar with when we think about a healthy plate. And we think about our sort of quarter of a plate of protein. So if we think about an average meal might be 600 calories. If anyone's had a My Food Bag meal or a Hello Fresh, it might be between five or 600 calories. We typically get about 250 calories on, on this type of plate from protein. So if we think about the protein sources that we can get out of 215 cal 250 calories, I put this sort of graphic together. So you can see here out of our 250 calories, there's animal proteins and fish. We're going to get a lot higher protein. So that's the protein per in grams that we get out of those 250 calories. And you can see here, as we start going into our plant-based options, like our beans, our chickpeas, you can see we can still get a good protein source, although it's less concentrated, so it's half. But the key thing here is have a look at the portion size that we need to get. So to get that 250 calories and to get that 20 grams of protein, we need to be consuming about almost one and three quarter cups of, of sort of kidney beans. And most athletes or individuals will start to to switch to more of a plant-based diet and more often than not, they'll significantly under consume these options. So a lot of the time in the clinic, we're, we're really working around ensuring the portion size are adequate and, and coaching um, our patients and their parents around what a sort of well-balanced nutrition plan would look like. And this, this becomes a little bit more problematic as, as you could imagine when we've got someone training um, twice a day or they could be a, a dance um, athlete where they're dancing for five or six hours a day and, and then the energy expenditure really goes high. So what, we, what we're trying to do in the clinic is we're basically trying to periodize energy, which we've come up with this concept around energy availability over the day. So part of the, part of the, consult, part of the consult is to spend an hour trying to get a really good understanding of their input, what they're doing in a, in a weekly training schedule, what that looks like in the day, and then we create these plans for them in the next week. And so this, I'm just going to take you through like a football player, for example. Up the top would be the rest day. So you can see here, we've got the 2,200 calories, um, very minimal energy expenditure, just time on feet, perhaps. And then we've got this day. So we're going to go for a run in the morning for 60 minutes, going to do a home circuit in the afternoon. And now we're burning 1,100 calories over here on the left. So you can see the adjustments we're trying to make as we're having pre and post run and we're having something a little bit higher in that afternoon and including now an evening snack. And Dave, yeah. can I just add in something to you, what you're saying, just to help support that? Because um, I also think it was a question as well, is the reason the timing of this is so important is that within day energy availability, so not eating for six hours and then playing catch up at the end of the day, it can, is more likely to cause menstrual dysfunction than if it is, um, like if you're eating a still a low uh, energy diet. So it's actually been proven that there, if there's no difference in the actual energy availability, like how much they're eating in, but they're having long periods where yep. they're not eating and energy availability is really dipping, then that has um, menstrual disturbance consequences and performance consequences. So Dane is trying to cover that by eating before and after and not having fasted trainings, which you know I see so much with this problem. Yes, and a key thing here is this is a high energy availability. So we've got that target of 45. So what we're dealing with here is we're trying to resume menstrual function. And so we've got an athlete here that's been hypothalamic amenorrhea potentially for two years. So for, a, for an athlete that's not got menstrual disturbance, their energy availability might fluctuate between 30 to 45, and they might be in good health and in good training. So that's why the importance, as you'll get into, Sarah, and the questions around being able to to monitor athletes is, is really important if, if you're thinking this seems really, really high energy intake. And then we've got a football game. So again, what we're trying to do is educate our athletes. Our, I shouldn't say athletes because more often than not, it's, it's uh, recreational um, active patients that we do see, like Sarah alluded to. So that's the importance of periodizing energy over um, different training days. So we try to create our plans around that. And then simply what we do then is just giving them information around what that would look like in food, what's a 400 calorie breakfast, different options for lunch, snack options, and how to get that balance in their plate. So that's um, essentially uh, what we're trying to do in the clinic. And I've, I've just put a, a note to end there with my slides to stop me talking. 
Okay, guys, so there's been some quite good questions come through. Um, I can see some of them are possibly more directly related to menstrual cycle, maybe identifying some people at risk and how to identify people, but some are kind of more clearly related to, to nutrition. So I might flick a couple at you, Dane, if you don't mind. So th there's a good one about um, the concept of macronutrients and um, a lot of endurance athletes are thinking about a low carb, high fat diet. Um, what, what are your thoughts about that and, and, and how that might impact your ability to get enough energy? Yeah, so there's, there's a few things going on with, with a question like this. So first of all, a lot of the research in, in sort of low carb, high fat diets to start with have been done in male athletes. Very little research in general in sports science has been done, but especially in female athletes. Um, what Essentially what we're trying to do when we recover is we want to get the energy in. So any energy is good energy. But what we also know is with low carbohydrate diets, there has been a bit of research done in liver glycogen. So when there's low liver glycogen, there is suppression of reproductive hormones. So a low carbohydrate diet is, is not necessarily a good strategy for a female athlete, especially when they're at risk of low energy availability. Um, secondly, any, any diet that basically cuts food groups out, you're gonna have a hard time in getting the energy availability right. Um, there are some athletes that can do it and what you typically see in an athlete maybe experimenting with a low carbohydrate high fat diet is they won't simply rapidly increase fat intake and the same when we often see athletes switch to a really like a vegan or a really uh, restrictive plant-based diet is that it becomes quite challenging when you have a high fueling requirement if you are fueling for for life and health and you're not doing that exercise or your goal is to lose weight you can see why these types of diets can be really powerful because you can easily cut out 500 to 1,000 calories quite quickly. Um, but in our athletes, that becomes quite problematic or, or anyone that's, that's physically active. And there's some psychological implications, I think, that we often see when people are following the, the really restrictive type diets as well. Um, so I think that's part of the management of all this Redis process, whether it's inadvertent or not, is kind of trying to normalize food and you know, I think a, a question popped up before is what do you say to these these people um, to try and encourage them to eat? I say eat, eat like an athlete, not like a chick, um, particularly in the in the female population, trying to convince them to eat two and a half thousand to three thousand calories a day is hard going. Um, but if you put it into a kind of a science way and show them what their body needs and why they need all the food groups uh, and normalize it for life and for long term um, better outcomes, and I think that kind of messaging of trying to normalize things as much as possible, but eat lots of it is important. Um, and another question, Dane, I mean, that's a really good point, Sarah. Um, I, didn't, I was just obsessed with the questions that were coming through, task focused. Yeah, go so um, um, Dane, there's a question about the, the number of grams per kilogram of protein. Um, is that still a relevant thing to think about? Is there a, a number yep. that you'd be thinking about for more of a, a running endurance athlete? Yep, yep. So as far as energy availability goes, it, I mean, yeah, the, the key thing with athletes is we need more protein. And so especially there is a lot of emerging research with female athletes in certain times of their menstrual cycle will need, will need higher amounts of protein. But I think the key message that gets lost is, yep, yeah, most athletes or patients that we see, I would say they're under consuming protein. And that can easily be included with, with simple options in recovery and optimizing their meals to have higher sources of protein. But typically we might look at the general recommendation for the population might be 0.8 grams per kilo, but that's really to sort of basically stay alive. And then 1.6 to, to anywhere to 2.6 grams per kilo. So 2.6 grams per kilo, if we're training really hard or we're looking to maybe lose body weight, we need to maintain as much lean tissue. But I would say a good target would probably be above that 1.5 grams per kilo. Okay, and just maybe the last one. So um, you mentioned some of the challenges of people going to a plant-based or vegan diet. Um, do you have any sort of practical recommendations for people about what they might do if they are wanting to pursue that diet? Yeah, I would just say, if you can, work with, a, work with a dietitian so you can start to plan your sort of meals. If you've got a really high energy output, you really want to prioritize that. Um, if your sole focus is to, to lose weight, then then it's not so much of an issue. But what we're wanting to do is make sure we have an awareness of how we can get protein sources from, from those sort of plant-based options and what the portion sizes look like. 
Um, a lot of athletes now use sort of pea proteins or plant-based proteins. And if they use those well, they can easily pop their protein content up quite well. So it definitely can be done. It's just a matter of being really well planned rather than switching overnight and just taking animal protein off your plate. That can sort of set you up to fail. Okay, so look, we might we might park the discussion specifically about nutrition at the moment, and, and then I think we'll hand back to you, Sarah, to talk just about an assessment or an approach to maybe identifying these patients that are at risk and how you might go about uh, assessing and managing them. There's some really good questions, which um, I think you're probably going to answer as you go along, but if you don't, well, we I do see them there and we will get back to them. Uh, so I, I, I encourage anybody that's suspected of having redis, whether it's the coach or the physio or the GP, um, they need a medical assessment. So the reason for that is it's a diagnosis of exclusion. So one of the causes for not getting periods is being pregnant, for example, or not having a uterus. So there are some things that we don't want to miss. Um, but I think it's really important that there is a medical assessment. And so when someone's referred to me, um, and usually, and I encourage people to come with their coach or with their parents, um, and so that there's you know, people in the room to to really add quite a good collateral history. And what I'm trying to work out is, you know, basic things like their sporting goals, their training load, and I go every day. I want to know what they're doing. I want to know how much they're on their feet during their day-to-day -day life at school. Uh, if they train during the day, I want to know exactly what food they're bringing with them, what they have when they get up in the morning, and when the last thing that they eat is. And in between that, I'm always trying to work out, is this somebody that's got disordered eating? So do they ever eat cheap food? Do they ever have a piece of chocolate? If they're going to have bad food, what would they have? And when someone says to me, I have one piece of dark chocolate as my naughty food, I follow a vegan diet, I fast in the morning, I bake, but I give it away. So all these kind of things um, leans towards a bit of a food obsession, energy restriction, and often put some big red flags up. And so when we're when I'm in the, when in the clinic room, I'm trying to work out about their stress fracture risk, their family history of either psychological issues or gynecological issues, whether they've been on the pill, which is a really important point. So the contraceptive history is really key. So often I'll see people who say, yes, I've been having periods since 14. I was put on the pill at 15 um, for contraceptive reasons or whatever reason. And I've been having a bleed, a period they say, um, when I take the sugar pill. And so that's a really important point is that's a withdrawal bleed from removing the body's or exogenous hormones. Um, so when we're removing hormones that aren't the body's ones that they're making and people are getting shedding of the lining of the uterus. So it's not actually the body causing the hormone uh, surges that are required to have a normal period. So once I'm trying to work out, are they getting normal periods or are they not, then it's working out why. And then it's working out the other things that they do. So a typical patient uh, is almost your, you know, a private school girl sometimes with the badges falling off their blazer with the amount of things that they do in their life. So there is very much a, a personality trait that's been written up about this where, you know, very talented academic students often and uh, perfectionist, perfectionism traits are very common and very, very good at what they do. Sometimes um, they're doing too much because of that, but at other times they're actually using the, the food or the lack of food as a control mechanism for some of the maybe underlying anxiety or mood issues that are also there. So I guess I'm trying to put people into a, a, a is this severe? Is this, you know, is this just gonna be really basic education of have a protein shake or eat better after training? Or is this something that we're gonna have to wrap a big team around them um, to diagnose? So I usually do a long history. I spend an hour with these patients. Um, I nearly always do a full hormone profile panel and I you know, do a few other blood tests to rule out any other, anything else that could be disrupting the axis like thyroid hormones and um, just rule out a few things. And for some of them, as someone's also asked, I do do a bone density scan. Now they cost about $200. Uh, they're very useful as baseline. Uh, they're obviously based on standard deviation and I wouldn't go through the public system in this in my clinics generally because they wouldn't fit necessarily the criteria. But for me, knowing the baseline bone density, particularly if they've got disordered periods or not getting them, then I think it's really important. Um, so, so Sarah, just I don't want to interrupt there too oh. much, but there's a couple of, of points that you've alluded to there that uh, we've 
and um, there's a question about the DEXA scan and the, the funding there is for osteoporosis, not for this type of patient. Oh, that's correct, yeah. yeah. Um, and then perhaps could you just elaborate on, on what blood tests that you would typically get? Yeah, so I do yeah full blood count, uh, I, full iron studies because nearly always uh, ferritin is reduced and that can be affecting the fatigue that they always tell me they have. Um, I check their thyroid function, I check their FSH and LH um, and the estradiol. I always check the serum testosterone because sometimes one of the things that can cause irregular periods or not getting periods is uh, polycystic ovaries. And so sometimes then that will lead me to also doing a pelvic ultrasound to look for this too. Um, and yeah, so just a range of uh, like hormone blood tests to try and put people into a diagnosis box, I guess. And what I often see um, for a classic patient who isn't getting periods, uh, maybe had a stress fracture and is feeling tired, is a suppressed estrogen. Uh, the whole the, uh, progesterone is likely unrecordable because you need um, the progesterone is what is important for ovulation. Um, so usually it's limited estrogen, low progesterone, and then it could also have a low LH and FSH as well. Um, and what we typically see as we see recovery is we're really trying to get the estrogen to improve, which is really important for all the other hormone pathways. Great. And if, I, if I'm starting to battle, that's when um, our colleagues at Fertility Associates who are extremely um, you know, experts in this, they're just amazing. So we, we often refer on if we're thinking this is more in the severe end or someone's going to require uh, medication, for example which isn't the mainstay. I spent a good couple of years trying to turn this around from an education point of view. Cool. So look, I'm gonna really go off on a tangent yep. just to uh, mess, mess up your flow, but there's a, another good question about um, who, do you, who do you think should be at the center of managing the care of this type of patient? So the suggestions that have been thrown out here, are a coach, strength and conditioner, nutritionist, specialist, physiotherapist, psychologist, so, you know, do you think that there's a standard approach? Do you think there's one type of person that should oh, be leading this? I think it's so it's so different, but I, I kind of feel that the, in my opinion, the a medical professional, whether it's a GP with an interest in this or a sports and exercise physician, should be the traffic director. I think that we we should be owning this this problem because it's very common and it's you know we can spend quite a bit of time with this patient and pulling in the right people like Dane, right going right. There's a there's a really big psychological component of getting this person to eat more, their mood is really suffering, they're struggling with the reduced exercise we sometimes have to prescribe. Um, we need psychology to really help us with this problem. Um, but I think we can't do this without getting the coach and the strength conditioners on board as well, because if, if people are still doing too much or they're not having a rest day and they're still overtraining, you know, there, there is some, some research to say that recovery will speed up if we keep their heart rate under 130 beats per minute. That's quite hard to convince someone to do. And sometimes when it's severe, that's where we have to go. But we need everybody around them, including the parents, to all be on board. So I think it's a big team approach, but needs to be directed medically, in my opinion. Yeah. And do you, do you think that that's true for all parts of the spectrum? So, I mean, obviously, when someone has a, a more significant yeah. problem, um, yeah. that, that seems like a sensible approach. What about the, the young athlete who perhaps is somewhat uh, fall into this by accident? Yeah, and so a great question because I think we're seeing, I think that's where the coach and strength and conditioner and parents can be just so helpful with some a few behavior changes or culture changes. So for example, in gymnastics, it's very uncommon for people to sit and have a sandwich mid-training. Um, but it, for example, it could actually be a really good thing for them to do. So, and maybe the parents helping pack a sandwich or pack whatever's on their nutrition plan or suggestion like it won't take much but if 300 calories will tip them into energy balance then you know that's a really straightforward way of managing it and doesn't require really my specialist input yeah so i think that's a really good point is that we all have an opportunity to influence here don't we and and prevent this becoming a problem yes much better to be the ambulance at the top of the cliff i just second that mark as far as my um experience goes it does make my job a lot easier if they've had a full um, especially the ones that there's really high in risk if they've had a full assessment by Sarah or the endocrinologist to really understand what they're going through it seems to make them really buy into the nutrition side rather than 
if they see me first, it, then obviously it just takes a little bit longer to then get to see the, the sports positions. Yeah, and, and there's two quite interesting uh, comments here around physiotherapists and the role of, of physio. So I'd be interested in your um, position on this. One is um, around, do, do you think that physios should refrain from giving dietary advice um, because it may be out of scope for them? Um, I think, I think sort of like Sarah alluded to, I think good culture and good general recommendations are always healthy. I think it does get into trouble if you're trying to assess energy availability. It's, it's quite hard at the best of times. And I've sort of been lucky enough, I've been in this area sort of three to five years of, of really going deep into energy availability. Um, and I guess, yeah, if, if you're not experienced, one, you can just prescribe way too much energy um, and then we can get unwanted weight gain or we can just be way too conservative. So I would say good, good healthy messages and good conversations around healthy eating and good body composition language. Um, but for the real nuts and bolts, I think, um, yeah, specialist help is, is definitely helpful. And the, the one thing I'd say there, Dane, is to support that I, I don't feel like it's a role for people to prescribe supplements um, or unless they're coming to someone like you for that. So I feel like we should be able to get our energy from our food, not from supplements. And I reinforce that all the time as this should be with a balanced diet. We don't need the expensive stuff. We should be able to do this quite in a, quite a straightforward way. So I would kind of avoid that from a physiotherapy point of view, for example. Yeah, but I mean, I, I think that's the, um, when I think about concussion, we sell the message a lot about it's everybody's responsibility. And I, I personally would feel that this is everybody's responsibility as well. Yeah. Um, and, yeah. There's a lot of responsibility in asking the key questions. So yeah. I think that conversation around menstrual health and menstrual cycle is, is really a key one that needs to be yeah. asked. And that, that's a real key marker for us. Yeah. And then just related to the, the physiotherapy question I asked before, it's um, at, at what point do you think um, this one is about physiotherapists should be discussing diet and when should they refer on to someone, uh, the, the form performance dietitian has, uh, has been, has been used. So it's uh, catching on Dane. Yeah, cool. Yeah. I, I guess um, I just lost your question there, but I think, um, like I said, I think there's, there's, the, the thing that we struggle with with nutrition is that everyone eats everyone everyone eats food every day so everyone kind of thinks they're an expert in their own diet and what's right for you is not necessarily right for someone training three times as hard as you so that can take a bit of context to understand those requirements but there is definitely like i said i'm not saying don't say anything but i think good good uh positive conversations around food and the importance of fueling are really important and then when we get to the nuts and bolts of things, I think that's when we, you know, have specialist help. Can okay. I just I feel like I haven't said the, the point uh, um, and I feel like I need to. Um, I, I sell, and I think a question came up before, is I sell the, the menstrual cycle uh, when I'm having this conversation with people. It's almost, it's traditionally been seen as a really negative thing. People used to get upset when they'd get their period on race day. They'd think they were going to go badly. Um, whereas I actually think, and it's been shown, that it's probably a little bit of a superpower for a female and it's far better to have a period than not to have one from a performance point of view. And that's because of the battery charge and all that. But the reason I, th I make sure people are off the pill if we're concerned about this issue, for example, is to use this as our external thermostat to say, yeah, we're in balance, our body's working as it should. And for that reason, you know, we get people to track the cycles. It's not hard to use Clue app or Fit a Woman um, and they can put it on their iPhone and they can just, they know then when their balances are off or the external thermostat is off. I think it's just a really important thing that, you know, and a physio could easily do that. Say, are you tracking your periods? That That's not a difficult thing to do. And it's, and I encourage everybody to do it. Um, so Sarah, we're going to start freestyling a little bit around. So we, um, we are going to try and stick to an hour, but um, if there are questions, we'll, we'll obviously stay. So it gives us about another 10 minutes. Um, so one, you sort of just talked about the, the menstrual cycle as being a kind of barometer. What about the contraceptive pill? What, what role does that have? Um, what problems might that cause? What do you think about that? So the oral contraceptive pill was you know it's revolutionary in female health and society like it is an absolutely amazing thing for what it's allowed and what it can do and for people who have painful periods 
So dysmenorrhea, endometriosis, uh, the, the oral contraceptive pill can really help their symptoms. So I am not blanket anti the pill. However, in this setting where someone is taking a pill because they don't want to get a period and they prefer to not, for, you know, they run around in togs for triathlon, they don't want to get a period, so they're trying to run their packets together. I educate them and spend a lot of time trying to talk to them about the importance of getting that regular cycle and potentially using other types of contraception, barrier contraception, maybe even a marina um, intrauterine device is, is, is a good option too. And so I tend to try and get people off the pill if I can. And Mark is laughing at me. <laughs> Not laughing at you. It's just more more feedback about the beard. But uh, oh, right. <laughs> yeah. Did that answer the question? Yeah, I try and I try and use it for people that want it for contraception or or, or painful periods. But I, I like to try and encourage people's own hormones, and we need to see a good three to six months of regular cycles before I'd say, yep, okay, you can you can go back on. Yeah. Look, I've got a great question. This is possibly my favorite question of the night. Is around. You know, we ask a uh, young woman often about their periods. Um, yeah. So the question is, what would be the male equivalent to asking if you get a regular period? Yeah, great um, question. And, and how uh, do you as medical professionals get a quick insight into the reproductive health of a male athlete? Yeah, and so um, really good question. And I, I mean, I must see maybe seven female athletes to three male athletes potentially. Um, but I had somebody present to me with fatigue who'd gone high fat, low carb diet, high endurance output and I just mentioned to him oh you know how's life going and he goes oh I'm really we're really struggling to get pregnant um and that's really interesting wife was healthy but because he was so energy deficient his sexual dysfunction um was causing problems with their you know, getting pregnant and often testosterone is suppressed as well so males we often see low mood maybe some sexual dysfunction and, and testosterone can be uh, suppressed so it's really hard because we don't have the monthly bleed but there are actually some some really interesting questions with mood and fatigue and um yeah vigor losing a little bit of um drive all that is is a really important question for a male athlete there is work in this um there is like a male questionnaire that's yeah. being developed and a, and a big one of that is, is sex drive and, and mood so a lot of people will measure mood with sort of daily wellness but yeah, a lot of it is that question around sex drive, and if, if that's low in a in a young male, then that's that's not normal. Yeah, and that's like things like uh, software, and I do this with the athletes when they're training peak software, and they allow you know you put your daily metrics. You can see before you know there's actually blood or physiological changes. You can see when energy balance is disrupted, mood and um, type, mood drops, and fatigue often increases, and that's before we may even see anything in the blood. So that's where an athlete being able to communicate, I'm feeling tired and I'm feeling this and the coach being able to go, what could this be? Like there's a really important role in that. And that's where we can get onto things early rather than, um, you know, down the track where we can't get our wives pregnant, for example. Yeah. So, so um, another interesting question here is that, like often uh, the athlete's goal um, or the coaches and the athlete's goal is for them to lose weight. So, um, how or when is that okay uh, and and how can you sort of monitor that or plan that around um you know some athletes potentially may need to or may want to lose weight so how do you approach that so i think this is where dane and i would probably work quite closely together on this and so i think it would be um kind of reinforcing that if we feel well and have a very clear fuel plan around the training, the body should probably go to the level where it needs to go if they're actually not having prolonged periods where they're not eating. Um, and so I would usually try and check that they were safe to do this from a psychological point of view, I guess, as well. And then Dane, I imagine I'll leave you do what you need, to, what you want to say, Dane, but generally just slightly undercutting the calorie intake for a short period of time is probably safe but there's got to be a pull the pin where it's no longer safe. So injury periods, all that kind of thing. Yeah. Yep. So, I mean, this is always a big part of high performance sport is that you, at two certain times, athletes do need to lose weight. They do need to lose body fat potentially. And so I, the key thing here, that's what really got me interested is, is trying to prescribe a, a nutrition plan for, for say a swimmer that's expending 1500 calories a day. You have to have a really good understanding of, what energy requirements they need that you can subtly reduce these 
and still maintain energy, but gradually safely lose weight. Um, a, a one size fits all diet will eventually put probably someone into a certain state of low energy availability across the week. So a diet that's prescribed across a week is really important. Everyone does things differently on different days, but you can safely lose weight on a moderate energy availability. But the key things, obviously, um, for an example, you might have a patient that's looking to lose weight and has a history of stress fractures, they have a regular menstrual cycle, then that's not the time that we want to further reduce energy out of their diet. So a lot of that sort of assessment has becomes really important to the context. And the, the other part of that is, Dana, I think you probably agree, and I'm hoping that we're moving out of this, and I've seen it amazingly in some, um, some of our high um, performance circles, is the conversations about weight are generally, you know, we don't need to have them as much. Um, and, and I don't know that it's necessarily the coach's role to say that to the athlete. I think it's better to come from medical professionals and things like that um, for a whole range of social issues and um, coaching issues that that can cause and what it can do to the female athlete psyche. So there's a whole range of kind of, and sometimes I don't even weigh my athletes because I'm just trying to get them to fuel. And particularly these secondary school athletes where sport is supposed to be fun and they're doing five different sports and eating 1500 calories a day. And then people are talking about body weight. So I try and kind of take the number away and then focus on the actual practice and try and encourage those around them to also ignore the scales and the numbers. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah, completely. Right. So there still are a few more questions. I, I think it's probably worth mentioning that you guys are keen to, on seeing this type of patient. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so um, while Sarah is based in Queenstown and Dane is based in Auckland, one of the things that I guess COVID-19 has taught us all is that we're quite good at doing telehealth consultations. Um, and, you know, do, do you guys think that this is something that you've uh, found lends itself quite well to telehealth? Well, for, for me, um, most, I mean, I do like, sometimes if I need to examine them, I'll make sure a doctor has examined them. Um, but I feel that 90% of this is coming from the history and then the, the education is the main thing once we've got the diagnosis. So telehealth is perfect for that. And it's enabled me to see people around the country with this problem. You know, I probably see four or five a week at the moment um, around the country. And it's great because the messaging is getting out there and um, it's kind of a, there's a bit of a contagious effect on it. If people start recovering, they start talking to other people. And so it becomes, yeah, it, it's kind of removing that barrier. So that's been really, really good thing for telehealth. And Dane, does it work well for your consultations? Yeah, yeah. I mean, prior to COVID, I was seeing a lot online and it sort of just really uh, increased it a lot because my sort of assessment and education and then sending out the plan afterwards is, is basically the same process. Um, whether it's done in person, uh, very rarely or almost never that we need to assess body composition. We might have existing data, uh, DEXA scans. We, we don't want that invasive practice. We're essentially trying to, to refuel the athlete. So the, the experience is, is really the same. And even in Auckland now, people are wanting to avoid driving halfway over Auckland and do it from their living room. Yeah. So, so look, um, I'll maybe just quickly say thanks to you both now. Um, it's been really excellent hearing from you both and, and hearing about your approach to this type of problem. Um, some of you may wish to drop off now, but we've probably got another half dozen questions. We've got time to answer some more. Um, so we might just crack on for a little bit longer. Um, is that okay with you guys? Mm -hmm. yeah. So um, there have been some sort of quite interesting practical questions. So when you restore someone's energy availability, um, perhaps Sarah, how quickly would you expect their menstrual irregularities to, to kind of return to normal? Well, I'm just going to show you my little slide on this one, actually. So really good question. Um, if I can do my screen share. Uh, but basically, oh, I might not come up. Um, what we see is, you know, energy status can be restored within days. And then... Uh, menstrual, menstrual status can then be months, so sometimes two months, sometimes three months, but bone density can take years um, and, you know, even one to two years, and for some people it might not come back depending on what age this is all um, happening, but I think the bit that I see take the longest and the, the bit that causes the most problem is the psychological aspect of what this does to people, so just that constant food obsession or energy and energy out that takes a long time um, 
you know, it could be even a decade for some people when they've got into a really prolonged way of thinking. But what I also encourage people is, you know, things could turn around in a couple of months um, if, if we do it all really well and we, and we monitor the output and increase the intake. So I don't tell people to stop exercising when I first meet them unless there's very, very, you know, significant problem with their health. But I usually try and slowly reduce things or add in a rest day until I start to see recovery. If I stop them from training day one, I would never see them back as a patient. And so I try and do it gently. And if we need to pull the pin, then we pull the pin. But it can take a long time to recover. Yeah. I mean, I think an important point there is that it is quite variable, isn't it? Very uh, variable. Yeah. Everybody's different. Um, and then a question perhaps for you, Dane, is about measuring the resting metabolic rate. Do you see a need for that? Is that something that yeah. you think needs to be done? How often does it need to be done? Um, yes, it, it's done in like a research setting, I guess, is, the, is, is probably the key way to say it. It can be done. We do see more people potentially offering the service, but the, the, one of the limitations is it needs to be fasting. It needs to be done typically to get an accurate result, 24 to 48 hours of sort of complete rest, which is really problematic to do that in a clinic setting or even with athletes. Um, secondly, it, it's, it varies over the menstrual cycle. So we typically, for best practice, we probably need to repeat it within a week, um, within five days to ensure we're getting the same uh, measure. But what we're trying to do to recover is we're trying to use, um, we, have a, we, can, we can estimate some really good estimations of requirements from our calculations. And then we're just assessing how the body adapts to that. So we might be looking at blood, blood markers with estra, uh, estradiol as a key one, and then resuming a menstrual function. That's, it. That's our key outcome, because if we've restored menstrual function, then we know we've got enough estrogen to support bone health and, and performance. Okay. And I think someone asked it before was, um, you know, a lot of the time we are encouraging weight gain. Um, it's not always the goal. I, like you say, menstrual function is our key goal too. Um, but sometimes, or a lot of the time, that does come with a little bit of weight gain, which is difficult for people, but you need to educate them on that straight away. Yeah, and there's a strong bit of evidence, isn't there, that the, the, the weight previously held where normal menstrual function, that's that's a key indicator all the yes. time. Yeah. Um, I obviously work a little bit with football. Um, in, in my experience, um, having the coach involved is so important. So in, in football, it's not necessary about being the smallest or having the biggest engine. It's a, a coordinated thing. So you need to be powerful, you need to be strong. And having coaches selling messages uh, at multidisciplinary team meetings where they say, look, you are going great. Um, we're really happy with your aerobic performance, but you're being bullied off the ball. Um, you're being pushed around by the other players. If you want to succeed, you need to get stronger. You need to be more powerful. So ha have you seen, uh, I guess, examples where coaches have been really positive role models, where coaches um, and other athletes can really influence players' thinking? I'll let Dane talk about his sevens, but I, I mean, I've seen a really amazing, and I hope they don't mind me saying, but the women's track cycling squad, like the whole, the shift of as a group about fueling um, and how important it is for recovery and all doing it together. Like, it's just an amazing thing that they've done in the last few years. And that's not, not since I've been there at all, but I've just seen a really incredible change in a sport that is challenging to fuel enough. And I think Dane's had and done a great talk I've seen on sevens and how they approach the I think the walker in terms of getting strong and having some good uh, imagery around it too as a group. Yeah, I guess um, definitely I think the more awareness around this is, is there's a lot more uh, clued on coaches and support staff that sort of drive these messages. Um, I guess my experience with Sevens, I'm lucky enough to work with good coaching crew of Corey Sweeney and Alan Bunting that really promote individuality and body composition and physique that sort of and it's not a one-size-fits-all approach um, obviously the strength and power sports um, there isn't probably that drive for physique as you do get in some of the endurance or, or dance sports but I think yeah the, the more awareness we have around this and performance and health it just bodes well for um, yeah creating good role models and, and healthy athletes. Yeah. And, and look, you mentioned those more aesthetic sports. Would you have some suggestions for coaches out there that maybe we're just starting to think about this, some very practical recommendations, things that they might be able to do 
to minimise the, the likelihood of their play, their athletes developing this, these sorts of problems? Yep. I can speak um, just recently, on, on most weeks I'll, I'll see sort of gymnasts or dancers, and I have seen just recently examples of coaches where they've allowed or really made the, their dancers snack between sessions, where some will have a, it's, it's quite common to have a, a no food approach for maybe a six hour training session. And then just having that good, uh, often that will be a conversation. Is there pressure around body composition? And then athletes feed that, oh, my coach is great. He, he did the last thing he worries about or he or she. And those are the, I think those are the, 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 the shifts we're seeing in culture, which are really positive. Cool. Have you got anything to add there, Sarah? No, I, I think that's, I mean, you know, some of it's the, the gymnastics talk's been pretty interesting lately about even leotards and how challenging that can be when your sport is based on, you know, tight fitting clothing. And I think some of this, um, the coaching is really important, but I actually think looking at addressing the actual culture of the sport and the fact that maybe we'll see in gymnastics in the next few years, females wearing full body leotards like the men. And I think all of that is actually, you know, from an organisational level and rules level, I think that's really important movement um, where the, the focus becomes less on this and all on performance. Mm. Um, and I guess maybe this might be our last question. I'm not sure. But um, the, the question is about how quickly these symptoms can become apparent when someone maybe starts to restrict their diet or starts to exercise more. Um, so I guess the, the question is really what are some very early kind of signs or symptoms that maybe you might pick up on? So I often see, I mean, it's quite good when you you say cyclists, so it's quite easy to monitor power output. And so that might be, they might just not be hitting their power targets. So often a little bit of fatigue or where the engine isn't fueling. So fatigue, mood, sleep are often affected really early. And so that's, that's earlier than say the loss of period, for example. But I've seen a couple of athletes do junk free June um, because everyone else was doing it. And within a couple of weeks, like the mood was gone, the sleep was being affected, their tummies were bloated, and then we got lost period about six weeks later. So it can happen quite quickly, um, but equally can be reversed quickly if we get on too early. Yeah, and often it can, when you're sort of assessing an athlete or counselling, it's often you can pin it back to a certain period where they might have restricted eating or there was a period of weight loss when they were an adolescent sometimes, where five to 10 kgs of, of weight loss and that really um, sparked the, the low energy availability and sort of struggled since then. Yeah. Okay. And maybe I'm going to give you one more, just one last one. Um, so it's around, you know, you had some great slides, Dane, that, that talked about um, calories and talked about energy. Um, so is there a risk that people get too focused on calories and calorie counting and yeah. How, how can you go about looking at energy availability, um, helping educate people without talking about calories or becoming too obsessive about that? Yep, yep. So it's a good question. So the way that we use it is that we try to create a, a remembering that a lot of time we're dealing with patients as they're, they're the very uh, high end of the trying to recover, is that we use it as like a, a baseline. So we're not getting them to count calories. All we're doing in the plan is showing them an example of how much energy they need and this is the types of food they need to include. So we don't have anyone tracking macro or micronutrients or calories on an app. They're simply choosing foods to ensure they're getting the right energy. And I, for the last sort of three or four years, asking for a lot of feedback around, a lot of the feedback's been really positive around, like this, is, this has freed me up. I'm not counting calories. I, I know what I need to eat. But I will do that if I am concerned with... Um, uh, potential eating disorder does does using calories cause a trigger and yeah you know, I've never I've never had one yet actually that when we put the plan together when I talk them through how it will look that it, it causes a, any fear. So they talk about uh, at the um, International Women's Conference we went to in Boston last year they they talked about how we kind of need to transition sometimes in the more severe from conscious uh, eating to the goal being unconscious where it's just easy and we're looking at plates Oof, but they I don't need that. that. Yeah, so they often need to start with counting and then going to what the plates look like and then the freedom from it. But so sometimes we do actually have targets we need to hit when it's severe. But I think like Dane said, it's idea, it's more ideas and targets and what it looks like and normalizing it if we can. But I would emphasize um, if we are concerned with, obviously Sarah or the endocrinologist, Megan Stella, would if there is concerns with disordered eating, then I would refer on. And there yeah. has been occasions a couple of times. So in those situations where when we're, 
think we're dealing with a clinical eating disorder, then this strategy, yeah, we would refer on to specialists for their sort of nutritional strategies for it. And because there's often, and that's what seems to come out too, is the more we dive into it, there's quite a lot of underlying trauma and anxiety and depression and that things are managed, you know, best out of the sometimes sport almost condones these type of things and we kind of almost make it worse by keeping them in sport when actually they need to be treated outside the sporting arena um, rather than kind of using the I'm an athlete to allow kind of condone some of the behaviors and and not for not helping them get better so sometimes we have to remove them from this kind of setting into the real um, clinical psychology or psychiatry point of view as well and often I think we've become so obsessed with food groups carbohydrates carbs uh, fats that we've lost all common sense on how much we need to be gone. yeah yeah so okay. bringing it back to just energy <laughs> and food it's a lot easier than talking about yeah carbs and proteins and fats because that, that probably for a lot of people causes more triggers i think yeah and lots of color great hey look thanks thank you both um so sarah uh thank you for sharing your time and dane uh thank you as well thanks uh, all of you out there and around the country for, for joining us and being part of our webinar. So um, just a reminder that if you do want to refer these patients, um, they are patients that Sarah and Dane enjoy seeing. Um, and that because Dane is a, a registered dietitian rather than nutritionist, often people's health insurance will cover that. Um, and in most situations, health insurance will cover um, Sarah's consultations as well. So um, there is unfortunately a cost associated with that, but um, there are ways around that. So um, just a reminder that we will be posting the slides, um, this video um, and a couple of important links. So um, I, I emailed it or messaged a couple of you about the IOC uh, position statement on Redis, um, which I think is a pretty good resource. So we'll, we'll link to that as well. Um, but yeah, just thank you both for joining us and sharing your time and expertise. And uh, we look forward to our next webinar at some point in the not too distant future. Cool. Thanks, Mark. Thanks for having us. Thank Thanks, you. guys.